You're listening to the Virtual CISO Podcast, providing the best insight on information security and security IT advice to business leaders everywhere. Hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the Virtual CISO Podcast. With you, as always, your host, John Burry, and with me today, Chris Peterson. Hey, Chris. Hey, John. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, look, look, looking forward to chatting. Um, I always like to start simple. Tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what is it that you do every day? Um, yeah, you know, you know, long time cybersecurity guy, um, you know, began Price Waterhouse CNY when cybersecurity is becoming a thing. Um, and, um, you know, I had a, you know, great, you know, you know, good career working with great people. Eventually found myself wanting to go my own, uh, own path. And I founded Logarithm, um, along with uh, my co-founder, uh, Phil Valella. And we, uh, spent, uh, uh, quite a bit, of, quite a bit of time building. You know what we think uh, became a, you know, one of the you know, the best SEM platforms in the world, um, as, as well as you know forwarding advancements and you know fields like SOAR and NDR and even UBA. Um, so I had, you know had a good run there. Sold that in 2018 and took some time off and then started Radical about three years ago. Um, looking to uh, you know focus on a new mission. Um, I, I serve as the CEO and. Uh, spend a lot of my time focused on our platform and our product and building a team that can uh, that can you know, achieve our mission. Well, I, I, I wish you the same luck you had with Logarithm. Uh, I will echo that it was an industry leading platform. We did a lot of work in the in the sim space over the years. Uh, if you remember the, the folks from uh, eSecurity at one yeah. point and ArcSight yeah. and, you know, eSecurity got bought by Sentinel and then was Portigo Mars got uh, Portigo got bought yeah. by the Cisco Mars. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think you guys got it right before other people got it right. Like everyone in those days was trying to jam stuff into a database right. and that became sort of the, the downfall of it all. Uh, and they all started going in your direction, eventually going toward more towards appliances. So uh, I wish you the same level of success that you have with Logarithm, but that will be hard to duplicate, sir. Well, we intend to, <laughs> but it will, it will not be easy. But, uh, you know, uh, no, no. Have a great team. No, no. Uh, you, you don't want to try to go in the opposite way, right? Like a little bit of success, then the massive. So, you know, when you have the really big success, it sets you up for failure on the next one, even if it's a even if it's a moderately big yeah. success, right? Uh, well, g- best of luck Thanks. with it, sir. Um, so uh, I always ask, what's your drink of choice? Well, you know, I, I, I enjoy a variety of drinks, John. Um, you know, so um, I, I, I do enjoy, enjoy a nice bourbon and scotch. We have a tradition, actually, at Radical, the three founders. We uh, we do we do. Uh, uh, some, uh, uh, books and smoke, where we will smoke a cigar and drink a bourbon or scotch and and, and talk. Uh, but uh, my per- you know, so I, I enjoy that. My favorite drink, though, is it's probably a martini. So it's hard to pass a dirty martini up, and I like them up in the uh, in the uh, in the summer months, and um, I like them, uh, you know, you know, on, on on the rocks as well. Three olives. Yeah, my wife. My wife has slowly converted me to to drinking uh, drinking gin. I've I've been more traditionally a beer wine, a uh, lot of bourbon guy. Not scotch. The scotch scotch is just good whiskey wound, <laughs> ruined by Pete. But uh, so yeah, so she's got me kind of getting into the gins a little bit. So yeah, it's definitely a fun yeah. world. Um, you know, I'll drink them as a, a martini, and and I really favor the um, I'm a Campari fan. So so I, I like a, a, a good Negroni. Oh yeah, very nice, absolutely. All right. So um, thank you for coming on. And and the reason that I was excited to chat with you is that I thought you guys did a really interesting survey uh, of companies in the defense industrial base uh, where you talk with them about the state of their cybersecurity programs. Uh, I thought there was some really interesting data and I thought there were some great insights that uh, other folks in the DIB can draw from. So uh, to set the foundation for the discussion, I just make sure everyone's on the same page, like when we use the term DIB. What do we mean? And and we're going to at some point talk about CMMC. Yeah. Tell us what that means. Yeah, as well. sure. Yeah. So the the DIB or you know the Defense Industrial Base, you know, is a collection of you know two hundred to three three hundred thousand companies that form the supply chain for the defense industry. Most are familiar with the, the prime contractors, Lockheed, Raytheon, Boeing, etc. They're the big boys. Uh, but you know, under, underneath them are you know are you know you know, tier two primes. And then, you know, then just, you know, just a collection of companies that, that um, participate in, in big projects and, you know, make low level components, you know, that might go into, you know, next generation fighter um, or spacecraft um, tiers like hypersonics, um, you know, build proprietary software, you know, technology, you know, AI is a big thing right now, you know, robotics, et cetera. Um, and, um, and so, you know, this is, you know, companies that really, you know, make up, you know, the heart of our defense industry. 
and they range from you know you know single you know you know one person who maybe is a you know a consultant or small shop to uh, you know companies that have tens of thousands tens of thousands of employees. Yeah, it's it's remarkable to me how many are in that smaller yeah. group. You know, especially you know the bodies on bases kind of guys. You know, we see you know three, four, five, seven sure. people. You know, firms that are like we got to get CMMCL too. It's <laughs> yeah. doesn't it's not fair to us. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, you know it, it is. Because, uh, you know, you're, you're touching controlled and classified right. information, right? It's the way it is. Yeah. So talk about uh, uh, CMMC. Define CMMC and just let people know what yeah, that is. Yeah. So, yeah, so CMC is a compliance mandate that came out a few years ago, you know, you know, by the DOD, where the intention of CMMC, you know, is to create a framework and structure around which a baseline of security, you know, is implemented and then also audited and verified on a periodic basis. And that's really the big thing with CMMC is that, is the is the is the independent you know audit component through, through a you know third party assessment organization um, and um, you know you know currently the the ruling is is you know CMC level two is based on NIST eight hundred one seventy one um, and um, you know the ruling is expected to go into effect maybe early next year uh, but it, it's kind of been in flight and in motion for many years now to just keep getting pushed back but hopefully. <laughs> This date's going to stick, and we'll begin to see enforcement of this baseline security for these companies who desperately and truly need to achieve a higher level of cyber threat resilience. It was kind of funny to me as we all talk about you know CMMC going into effect, yeah. <laughs> but effectively CMMC is in effect and has yeah. been in effect since what like December of 2016. Yeah. Uh, you know, because yeah, and I know that it's kind of been up and down, but you know we are exactly where we were then, right? It, it, CMMC now is just the logically the enforcement of 800-171, which is something which you, if you are uh, subject to DFARS clauses, like specifically the 7012 clause, you've been beholden to that for the entire time. And theoretically, you should already be uh, certifiable. Uh, you know, any, anytime you send an invoice, you're asserting that you actually are in compliance, correct? That, that, is, that is true. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a mystery around all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always, you know, I'm always, you know, it's, you know, it's fast forward back to where we were, uh, it, with the exception of, like you said, we, we now have an enforcement program, which was terribly needed, yeah. right? Because, you know, realistically, you and I, you know, we both end up speaking with a lot of people in the DIB, and they're all complaining about, oh, we've got to get there, and we've got a long way to go, and it's going to take us a long time, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And my, our, my conversation was like, wait a second, <laughs> you, you, you're supposed to have been this yeah. way for, you know, since, for the last eight years. Yeah. I mean, I think it just, it just, you know, it goes to, you know, show that compliance, you know, absent and enforcement mechanism and audit mechanism and consequences doesn't actually really move the needle, you know, like PCI, you know, it's kind of, you know, you know, you know prove that out, you know, I mean, whatever it was, it been now almost 20, almost 20, almost, you know, 18, 20 years ago, you know, only once, you know, companies, you know, are going to be, you know, audited and held to a, to a standard of you can't do business anymore. Do they actually begin to begin to move? Yep. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the survey. Uh, the uh, I was surprised by some of the answers um, in part one of the survey where you talked to, with the orgs about their overall cybersecurity program. Yeah. Uh, most notably, there were a couple of answers that got me. Uh, interested. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on each yeah. of them. Uh, the first which surprised me was that only 62% considered cybersecurity to be a high or very high priority. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's good that 62%, you know, said high, you know, you know, said high or very high, it probably needs to be, you know, high or very high for, you know, for all of them. Um, I think, you know, this is some of this, I think is, you know, is evidence that, and we've seen this in conversations that we've had that there are a class of, of, of leaders, you know, who I don't think really understand cybersecurity all that well, um, or they've just decided to accept the risk. Um, and, and, and we've seen this conversations where it's like, look, you know what, if somebody's going to come after me, they're going to come after me. I can't stop. It's too hard. It's too hard. What am I, what am I really going to do about this? I don't have the resources to actually you know, to tackle this in any, any, any realistic way. So why even try? Um, and I do think that is, you know, that's, I think there are some just, you know, you know, leaders out there are a bit discouraged in terms of this is a hard problem to solve. And so we'll accept the risk um, and just, and just hope for the best and just hope that they don't find themselves in the crosshairs, you know, of a, of an adversary, whether that be a nation state or, or cyber criminal. Yeah, but it goes, it kind of 
flies in the face of another one of the findings, yeah. right, from, from your survey, which was that nearly half had cyber incidents that cost the company 100000 or more. And I think, you know, the number yeah. that was quarter million and half million was also significantly high. So when you think about those two, they, they seem to be sort of opposed to each other, don't they? Uh, well, opposed or maybe maybe very much aligned. Maybe the sixty percent who had incidents are the same sixty. You said now it's higher, very. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that um, way. <laughs> you know, so maybe they're the ones that got hit, and you know, they felt it, felt it in their pocketbook, and now they're you know, we should probably do something about this. Um, or maybe they just had very very good insurance you know, insurance policies, and, and it all worked out for them. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, and I think um, that to me was an interesting finding. Just you know, the amount of incidents that actually had financial consequences, and twenty nine percent said they had consequences of, of two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. That's a significant bill to pay. And keep in mind, this you know, this survey was a survey of the SMB segment. You know, you know, radical. We're focused on the SMB kind of sub five hundred segment because we think that is the most vulnerable segment in the uh, in, in in the supply chain. Um, and for a sub 500 person company, a quarter million dollars in, in an unexpected cost is meaningful uh, to, uh, you know, to their operating budget, bottom line. Yeah, and, and putting foundational cybersecurity elements in place that you're supposed to have based on the, your obligations anyway would cost you less than that, significantly less than that, right? And would have uh, offset the probability or likelihood of that happening by a pretty fair amount. It would, it would, and I think that you know, I think that goes to just I think another, um, you know, let's say you know, anecdotal finding that you know, anecdotal finding that we've had that that's you know, in this data and also in our conversations is that I think you know, a lot of these companies just you know they don't they don't really know what good looks like you know they're you know they're not a large enterprise that has been thinking about zero trust security defense in depth architecture. Um, Understanding the product landscape and how these products fit, you know, to build a very mature, you know, you know, cybersecurity operation and and, and resilient infrastructure. Um, you know, they 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 think about it, you know, think a bit more still in terms of endpoint security, network security, and you know, and, you know, multi-factor authentication is oh man, that's a big step forward. Um, you know, that's you know, you know, they're not thinking about the the vulnerability management program and attack surface management and you know, detection analytics and, you know, 24 by seven IR, you know, those, I think those are, you know, things that aren't really on their mind in terms of that's what strong security really looks, you know, you know, really looks like. And, you know, so that's reflected, you know, reflecting, reflectant in the, in the findings, you know, around the, you know, like the cost of these impacts, you know, you know where you know, we found that for that, you know, almost 60% of companies, you know, had four or more endpoints or accounts compromised in the past year. Now, that's likely how those incidents happened, how those costs were incurred, um, um, especially when you consider that the same amount, so they would take a week or longer to, to detect a threat in their environment. 27% said it would take a month or more, right? So, I mean, if you, know, if you have a compromised account or an endpoint and it's allowed to stay compromised for more than a week or a month, you know, you know, you know, you will, you know, you likely have an embedded adversary in your environment that at some point is going to result in an incident. Yeah, you know, I think there's a, I think there's a component of that. You know, you you don't what you don't know what you yeah. don't know. Um, but it was interesting to me because I do feel that there is a component of you don't know what you don't know, and that's been my experience with the Dib. But yet, the other piece which surprised me was that 67 percent of your respondents rated their security skill level as high or very high. Yeah which is incongruous with everything we've spoken yeah, about. True. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I tend to think there's probably a little human psychology at play here and, you know, you know, folks don't want to admit to being, you know, you know, you know weak in an area. I think this, yeah, I think coupled with this also is not really knowing what high or good looks like. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, you know, I think the, the, the benchmark by which they're assessing themselves, I think is a much lower benchmark than what it needs to be. Um, and, mm -hmm. And I, th and I think that's, you know, likely also why this is, you know, li you know, likely overinflated, right? I mean, these companies, they're like, you know, most of them are not doing 24 by seven monitoring, a very, very, very little in the area of more advanced detection analytics and IR and, you know, and, and immature vulnerability management programs. So, you know, and so, you know, I think if they understood, you know, like kind of those capability, you know, those capabilities are necessary they likely wouldn't rate themselves, you know, you know, as high, you know, or they're also just trusting that their MSP's got them covered and they don't really understand maybe what their MSP is or is not 
able to do for them at a, at a, at a high quality level. Yeah. Now, and in fairness to them, and I don't know how to interpret their responses yeah. here. <clears throat> I think even some of the better run organizations that we've both been in, you know, this idea of, of detecting within a week or a month, I think if you look statistically at a lot of the data yeah. that's out there, many of the breaches of most significance, uh, the perpetrator was in the network for many months, uh, sometimes a year, year and a half in some of the most famous breaches. And those are orgs that have, do have a, a lot more uh, mature programs. Well, absolutely. Uh, I think you know, one of the best examples of that and, you know, why we're focused on the SMB segment and the DIB, you know, is the, is the solar winds uh, breach from a few years ago, right? You know, you speak about, um, you know, hundreds of companies, you know, that were actively compromised, um, where these are some of the biggest companies in the, in the world that spend millions on cybersecurity programs have, you know, some cases, hundreds of, of, of dedicated you know, personnel, you know, Microsoft and FireEye and Department of Treasury, um, you know, they, you know, they were compromised for seven months, you know, by, you know, a nation state adversary before it was, before it was ever discovered. Um, and that's the same class of adversary that's coming after these, you know, after the, after the defense supply chain. Um, and so when we look at that, you know, that the fact that, you know, that, you know, that threat was able to go in those for seven months and companies that have invested everything that can be invested. I mean, they, whatever can you, whatever you can do, they've tried to do, they, they were still blind to it. And so to tell you, know, there's, it just tells, it just speaks to the, you know, how hard this is to do well. Um, and also the need to keep doing it better. Uh, and, and yep, Absolutely. So uh, in the second part of the survey, uh, you you focused on uh, out, and this is one where it was interesting to me that where in that first section I was like, wow, these these results don't align with what yeah. I see. Yeah. In the second one, it was the exact opposite. I was like, wow, these results align with exactly what we see. Um, you know that the vast majority of the defense industrial base that we work with, um, they are reliant on outside organizations. Uh, they use MSPs. They use MSSPs. However, they don't feel like they're getting what they needed in terms of uh, their, their ability to respond, uh, the value proposition of the support that they're receiving, and interestingly, the support with CMMC compliance. Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think naturally it makes sense that these companies would look to outsource, you know, certain you know, certain aspects of their you know their program, and 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 they are. I mean, it's, you know, the you know seventy one percent said they outsource to an MSSP, and they're getting some probably some level of of monitoring, um, you know, and, and, and response. Um, we tend to hear that, that that level is more like alert pass through versus them actually taking it end to end, um, but. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, you know, the outsourcing, you know, the, the, the more complicated functions of a security program, you know, is, is, is definitely, I think, a requirement for the segment. You know, these, these companies can't, they don't have the staff nor the budget to build their own SOC, you know, for, you know, for example. So I think, I think it makes sense uh, that, you know, that we're seeing some, out, you know, some outsourcing. I think the, what needs to happen in this segment, you know, we believe is that the quality, you know, of what's being delivered in that kind of managed delivery model needs to significantly um, improve. And I think it's been challenging to have a high quality offer in the segment because the segment is so price sensitive um, and, and it's been it's been hard to provide something that you know, is operates at a very high level of efficacy. Uh, when it comes to these more advanced security operations, kind of threat detection, tax risk management capability sets, at a price point that's affordable, um, you know, you know, we tend to think the time is now that this can be done with the advancements in technology, AI that can allow us to build something that can can, you know, be a bit be a game changer in terms of what can be delivered to the segment for a, a price point that is attainable, um, and that you know, it's a big part of our mission is you know how do we bring, you know, you know high you know high grade cyber threat protection at a, at a price this segment can actually can actually afford. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the data points, you know, in here in this section was that 82 percent would say that they, they plan to they plan to change providers, you know, which would indicate a, a level of dissatisfaction, which I, I tend to believe that goes hand in hand with kind of expectation setting, you know, and 
and sometimes over promising and under delivering around what some of these providers can actually do. And, and um, perhaps the segment also getting a little bit more um, aware of what they really want a provider to do in terms of that you know, quality and efficacy of, uh, of capability. Yeah, I think one of the one of the challenges there is that we have a tendency to conflate um, security and compliance. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've always said, you know, from back in the SIM days, you know, I used to talk with clients about, you know, security is about the needle in the haystack and compliance is about the haystack, you know, and trying to do both with the same tool, you know, sometimes it can can, you know, trying to serve two masters, right. yeah. uh, it can be can be problematic. So I do think you have that same challenge there. I agree with you that I would say the vast majority, you know, virtually all of the, the, the except for the largest entities, are going to be relying on somebody to help them from a monitoring perspective, yeah. you know, because they, they're not going to be able to staff, uh, a, you know, a full-time operation to kind of deal with the stuff that they need to yeah. deal with. So, the, and then, but I think that, like you said, anyone that's offering security monitoring at that price point, the likelihood that they are able to support and have the deep expertise required to address the compliance side is going to be a bit of a challenge, which is where maybe some of that dissatisfaction is coming into play. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. And I think that's, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good analogy, right? Because, you know, you know, if you look at the, the haystack, like log management, you know, you know, log management is the haystack. Sure, we're managing logs, we're collecting it all, we're dumping it into, into, we're dumping it into a giant repository. Um, and what really, you know, and that's fine for compliance, check the box, but from a security perspective, it's how do you look at that haystack, right? It's what, what are you, you know, what, you know, what are you looking for in those data points, those signals that might indicate a threat is present. Um, and to do that is expensive. It's, it's expensive analytics wise, it's expensive also that every single piece of, hey, you go look at, you know, every indicator you look at requires today, largely the involvement of a human. Um, and, and that is where the game needs to be changed. You know, and that's where we, you know, we see the advancements of an AI being a potential game changer in terms of the cost model here, right? Because that haystack needs to be looked at aggressively. Um, and it can't be, and I think that's the challenge a lot of MSSPs and MSPs face is, is the cost of operation to actually, you know, to investigate and to, to look into, to practically threat hunt. Those are currently you know, human heavy operations. It requires a lot of money to staff that up um, and, to, and to, maintain, to maintain that where the, the path through of those costs, I think, is often untenable. The price point of that is untenable for this market. Um, and, that's, and that's what, you know, that's, that's the fundamental shift that, that we seek to change. Yeah, I think some part of that, you know, so we see the same thing where a significant percentage of the people that are coming to us are coming to us because they weren't happy with the you know, first consultant group they work with or the first time they went through, you know, uh, 871 SSP development. Yeah. Uh, so is the problem, um, it, sometimes I think the problem is it's a bit of the blind leading the blind. So let, let's say that we're talking about uh, implementing the security operations center, the, the monitoring that's yeah. necessary. In order for that group to be effective, right, you have to have a clearly defined enclave. We have to know which systems are CUI relevant. Yeah. We have to know, you know, which logs on those systems we need to, to monitor. We need to know which events on those on those systems in those logs we need to monitor. The applications, application log, application yep. event types. Well, we, you know, that's the kind of information that you've got to give to the security monitoring folks in order in compliance monitoring folks to be able to do this for you. You know, is part of it, you know, or is it part of it, the blind leading the blind or, the, you know, or whoever was doing that initial implementation didn't get to the right information to support the folks on the back end? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it is. Um, um, I think there's probably a mixture of both in there, um, you know, but um, I, I do think it's, you know, this, you know, this requires, you know, some you know, upfront planning. And, and I think, you know, people are you know, looking at, you know, CMMC. Um, you know, or 871, you know, understanding, you know, how do you, you know, carve out that enclave and how do you make decisions around, are we going to you know, consider, you know, the full you know, corporate IT footprint in scope, or can we carve out an enclave and protect and monitor that? You know, and that is a, that's a meaningful conversation to have. Um, and one that can actually significantly reduce um, your cost exposure um, in terms of you know what you need to implement and implement where and, and what you need to monitor, um, but that is a 
but you know, but that you know, there is that is that is not an, e e an easy conversation or decision to navigate if you don't understand, you know, the you know the, the frameworks, the regulations, you know, what is considered CUI, what is not, and that's where, you know, a lot of our consulting partners, you know, have uh, you know can can you know help out a lot. Yeah, definitively on the CUI. I mean, you know, that's arguably one of the biggest challenges that you have during scoping is. You know, folks don't know exactly what is their CUI, what isn't. It's not properly labeled. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, many many times they don't understand the difference between CUI basic and CUI specified, yeah. right? Things with higher higher requirements like you know CTI or ITAR and things yeah. of that nature. So, yeah, I agree. Um, it, 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 it's a challenge. So you, you mentioned CMMC there. So that was what part three of the yeah. survey actually uh, focused on. Um, and I thought this was really intriguing to me. Uh, some of the data there was was surprising it was surprising to me that folks had such a good picture of, of an accurate picture but their picture didn't align with what i thought their picture would be so 36 percent said they think it's going to take them between one and two years to become cmmc l2 yeah. compliant and another 20 percent believe it will take them more than two years so that's that's interesting yeah. but when you map that against the fact that you know cmmc is on the precipice let's say you know we're going to start seeing this late this year, early next year in actual contracts. Uh, we know that they've already been obligated to be NIST 8171, which is CMMC compliant, like we talked about for the last eight years. And now we're seeing with our client base that many of the primes are pushing them towards being demonstrably uh, CMMC compliant prior to the actual lawmaking going into effect. Um, I thought it was weird that they acknowledge like, yeah, we're not going to be ready. <laughs> it is weird. It's something that's, it's been a, it's, it's a big, you know, head scratcher for us internally. And we talk about this where it's like, well, wait a minute, aren't they all supposed to already be effectively compliant? Um, and, and a lot of them would say, if you ask them, are you NIST 8171? They say, yes, 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 we're good to go. But then, you know, a, a breath later, a different conversation later, they would say, We've just begun CMMC, and we're a year and and we're and we're a year, a year away from compliancy. When you know CMC level two is based on eight hundred one eight 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 hundred one seventy one, um, you know, so it yeah you know, it's you know it would seem to imply that there's a disconnect in, in in kind of the the comprehension around what CMMC really is, you know, and, and perhaps maybe some over reporting, you know, of a posture on uh, eight hundred one seventy one. Again, kind of coming back to. You need enforcement. You need you need you need, you need audit and independent audit, and, and you need some enforcement mechanisms. Yeah, some some folks that, that I know in the ISO nine. Oh, sorry about that. You cut out for a second. Um, some folks that I that I know in the ISO nine thousand one space talk about when that became really the hot topic, and manufacturers had to move in that direction. That at one point there was like a fifteen to eighteen month month queue to be become ISO nine thousand one certified. Um, Given that you mentioned that there's 300,000 clients in the DIB, and I don't know what percentage of those, maybe a third, probably will be, need to be CMMC L2 compliant. Um, are the, in your mind, are the organizations that are not yet moving forward on this potentially putting themselves in a bad spot where there's going to be a queue, you know, a queue if you need to get into Microsoft 365 GovCloud, a queue if you need to get prevailed to implement stuff, a queue if Radical needs to do stuff for you. Uh, you know, a queue if you need to get a C3PAO assessment done. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be a real problem. Um, you know, there you know there are only so many um, C3PAOs that are you know, that are ready to go, and um, and once the you know, the rule goes you know fully into effect, they're just not you know they, they you know they they can they, they will it'll take time to process this backlog of companies all trying to get through. Um, I think that's going to create opportunity and, and risk, you know, for for companies, you know, companies that are ready that have kind of pre-planned and have got, you know, their C3PAO, you know, lined up and they're on the, on the on the schedule and they're already top, you know, near the top of the queue. I think they've got a unique business opportunity in a window where once they get through, they will have a unique ability to compete in the market um, versus those that are lower in the queue or who are not really even ready. And so when they Get through their audit. They've got a lot of remediation work to do and a lot of findings to go address. Um, you know they're going to you know be they're going to have a period of time when their you know ability to do business is going to be um, impacted. And and so it's 
I think, um, you know, you know, you know, we we've committed that we're going to be CMC level two. We're working on that right now. We've got a partner risk point that we're working with to, and, you know, and we're, you know, we're teed up, right? So we want to be one of the first through, um, cause there's also rules around cloud service providers, um, um, as well, um, in the, in the, in the ruling. So we want to make sure that we're you know able to serve this class of a customer, but our own experience is that what we're hearing is that there's going to be a backlog, um, and. And these, you know, these companies are, are, you know, they're, you know, they're asking for commitments. If you want to make sure that you have a, a kind of a date um, ready to go and we're there for you, that commitment needs to be made now. You, um, you mentioned that you guys are looking to go towards CMMCL2. I think that's another interesting uh, challenge point that I don't think enough folks are talking about is that for many of the organizations, they're they, they, the flow down requirements yeah. that, that are, are going to cause a problem, right? So if you're working with an MSP and that MSP is, let's say, providing security protection assets on your behalf, if they're not properly, uh, if they're not properly certified to do that, right? Or if you're using a cloud service provider and they're not, you know, FedRAMP monitored or equivalent. So I think that's the other challenge is I think people are going to get to what they think is the finish line and not understand that based on the way that uh, their system security plan is written, that core supporting components are not yet where they need to be. And they're going to have to figure out, either wait for those components to actually achieve that state, or they're going to have to actually switch components out. For sure. Um, that, yeah, that's going to be a big shakeout as well. Um, and, uh, you know, so, we, you know, we're, we're looking to get ahead of that. And we are being, yeah, we are seeing, you know, companies who, I'd say both the MSPs, and so we're talking to MSPs, and they are aware of this, um, and they are, you know, many of them are, are, are proactively looking at their at their vendor relationships um, and and who is committed to getting there, and so I think that's going to change the the market dynamics up over the next uh, over the next twelve months, and and we're also are hearing some I'd say more you know, knowledgeable customers who are also looking at their, their vendor list that they're directly managing, that they're, that they're directly managing visibility to as well to see where they are. Um, but I think there's a lot of companies who aren't thinking about this yet. And, um, and they, you know, will, will likely have a, you know, very unwelcome surprise when they realize that their MSP um, is not where they need to be. Therefore, they cannot actually achieve certification. Um, and they may need to scramble to go find a new, a new provider. And those things take time. You can't just go swap in a new MSP overnight. Right. Um, so that is a, you know, even, even worse if it's an MSSP. Sorry. I said even worse if it's an MSSP, right? Because I mean, Absolutely. I think the time that it takes yeah. to, you know, to onboard an MSSP and get them all the information they need, get everything operationalized, sure. get all the reporting in place, you know, so, you know, soak periods. Yeah. Uh, you know, cleanup periods. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's six months. Yeah, yeah, you know, to get it all running well, it can be. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think there, yeah, there's, yeah, there's a big shakeup, and you know, I, I, we'll see what happens with the rule. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it provides some grace um, in terms of some of the you know cloud service providers and and and, and you know, you know, you know, the service providers, um, hopefully what they will not do is provide grace around, you know, audibility and enforcement because that, that needs to get moving. Yeah, I think, you know, I, you, you hear that there, you know, there's going to be this concept of being able to actually be certified with a POEM in place. Yeah. And I know that a lot of the purists were like, oh, you can't do that. I kind of take a more practical view of it and say, A, I think it's somewhat necessary in order for us not to break things completely. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. B, I think it might have a, um, an additional valuable impact in that one of the things that I'm concerned about with CMMC is the fact that, you know, it's a once every three years. And my experience with people has been, if there is no enforcement, they don't do it. So to some extent, you know, someone poking their head in to make sure that the poems are progressing yeah. provides at least some level of ongoing initiative to keep the program compliant. Uh, I, you know, you know, I agree. I mean, from just a, a pragmatic perspective, you know, um, uh, you know, around, you know, there, there does need to be some reasonable phase in, you know, of this so that business can continue. Um, because, you know, in the end, we're managing risk, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's cyber threat risk, there's lots of IP risk, you know, espionage risk, but, you know, there's also a risk if the you know, defense industrial based supply chain comes to a grinding halt. That's also a risk. And so, you know, there needs to be a, a pragmatic approach, you know, to how this, you know, how this gets rolled out. And I think that's a, 
I think a very, a very reasonable compromise. And I also think, you know, having a, an annual check-in is going to be very important because if it's, if it's simply every three years, we're going to go do an audit and a verification. There's going to be erosion, significant erosion in that three-year period. Yeah, no question about it. Um, in part four, you asked companies about their future priorities. Uh, anything surprise you there in their responses? Not too much. Um, you know, I think... Um, I think I think a lot of that, you know, a lot of that aligned. I mean, what do you think? I thought it squared logically with some of the other stuff. Although, you know, again, you know, the, my overwhelming thought process was, you know, we're going to implement multi-factor authentication, which is sort of a basic protection that I'd expect to have in place anywhere. But like, I figure what the number was a third or somebody, would, which means a third haven't yet done right. that. So I thought the priorities were good. I just thought they spoke to a, a level of immaturity that didn't align with this, you know, the, the number of people they said were dedicated to security and then, and, uh, and that high, very high capability. Yeah. And I, and I, and I guess that is, I guess I say I wasn't surprised and I, and part of that is, you know, my expectations have been, I guess not lowered, I guess, but my, they've been somewhat met. And I assumed that this segment didn't really know what good was, um, you know, yet uh, that's, you know, the SMB is still kind of, you know, right, you know, Riding up the maturity curve of, of overall cybersecurity, um, and so I mean, ideally, I would have seen you know more prioritization around I think things like vulnerability man, you know, vulnerability management, attack surface management, threat monitoring, IR, things that are further along the curve of a defense in depth uh, architecture, um, versus a lot of it still being the tactical stuff, right? Mm -hmm. MFA, better network protection, you know, you know, deploying, you know, better endpoint protection, I mean, access are, control, right? Yeah, more are, basic block and tackle as yeah. well. Important things, but there, but it is. It's more just you know doing basic security well and just getting you know, some more modern capabilities in place from a you know, protection perspective. Um, and you know, like this segment, this segment's being targeted by nation state threats. Um, it's you know it's 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 you know it's it's industrial espionage, and these companies have got to move beyond just you know kind of core IT security. So um, in part five. Uh... You know, I thought you had some interesting actionable takeaways. Uh, one was if you're outsourcing cyber security needs, be wise about choosing a service provider. Um, that's a hard thing to do, you know, especially if you are a little, um, you know, it would be like me figuring out, you know, a, a doctor in a particular specialty. I don't, how, how do you figure out a good doctor, right? Uh, how, how, so how can uh, someone in the DIB, you know, find a good service provider? It is tough, um, and I, I and I think you know some of it you know begins with uh, I think increasing the education level um, within the DIB and um, even at a CEO level or whomever has been an executive level you know you know you know you know, you know mandated to um, overall you know lead this effort. Um, I think there needs to be increased education around what what really good looks like from a security perspective so that they can actually assess their third party providers through a lens of, of higher expectations you know, and, and, and also know what to look for. You know, so if somebody says we're doing, you know, you know, yes, we're going to do threat hunting, be able to ask the next set of questions that, you know, actually can help determine, are they really doing threat hunting or they turn on some correlation rules and call that threat hunting? Um, and, and that's certainly what we're trying to help with is, you know, is, is helping, you know, the, the broad markets, um, and folks we talk to kind of understand how do, how do, you, how do you really assess this? Because for a lot of folks in these, in these companies, it's just, this is not what they live and breathe. Um, and they tend to not have somebody often who's focused purely on security. And so we're trying to help, you know, generally educate on. What does that next you know, layer of security level look like and how do you assess if a third party provider is actually able to really do that or not, you know, or if it's they're more given a lip service? Yeah, and I think as, as many of them are potentially going to uh, re require some level of flow down. Yeah. Right. So, you know, so security protection assets, you know, anyone that's actually providing security protection assets as part of the solution. You know, I think to your point, asking them how they're achieving the requirements, you know, is going to is going to be a pretty good indicator. You know, if they stumble and, and are not able to uh, enumerate the implementation of these controls in their environment, if they're not able to provide any artifacts or evidence or, or speak intelligently on it, 
you know, I think that's going to be a red flag and should be a red flag. I, I absolutely agree. Um, and that, and that, that is another just great, you know, great, you know, great place to start a conversation to have, you know, is, is, you know, how, you know, how do you intend to yourself get to level two um, readiness? Yeah. The sec second one you had was, uh, <laughs> I smiled when I read this. And if you haven't started your CMMC compliance journey, giddy up. Yeah. Yeah. It's time to get going. Um, I mean, this takes, you know, this takes time. It's not easy. You know, there, you know, there are just getting the basics in place in terms of your know, policy and procedure and documentation and getting your access control, you know, locked down and group arch I mean, just there's, there's a lot to do here, a lot of work. Um, uh, you know, you know, when we, you know, we look at, you know, we drive, you know, part of what we do is we help to, you know, help to drive the compliance, you know, operation you know, for our customers through our platform. And, you know, we say six months is kind of what we target, you know, for a time frame. But that's with us actively driving it, you know, you know, through our platform, providing guidance and help and some nudges along the way. Um, you know, six in you know, six months is, you know, is, 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 is not easy. And so, you know, you know, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's May right now, the rule could be in you know, effect to end of Q1. And, you know, that's not, there's not much time to close the gap um, in terms of getting through, a, you know, figuring out where, you know, where you are and getting that first pass remediations done. Yeah, and I think I think six months is aggressive, and, and you know I think you can be more aggressive given the fact that uh, you're taking on um, a lot of the I think most challenging elements right. of this, yeah. right? So, so if you know, you, you know, it, you know, I don't know what the exact number is, but I would say either direct directly fulfilling a requirement or supporting a partially fulfilling a requirement. You know, I would say the, you know, the stuff you're experts in, the same system audit, logging, blog monitoring, yeah. reporting kind of components, right? Incident response SOC. That's got to be what, 40% of, of the overall requirements. So, you know, yeah. you know, so yes, you guys have the potential of getting it done in six months. And I think you'd even say that's challenging, even with your expertise and it being sort of one throat to choke. If an organization is trying to piece together best of breed, you know, yeah, yeah, that's going to get even a little bit harder, right? I mean, you know, I think a lot of the sure. organizations we're working with have been working on this, you know, six months, nine months, a year, you know, and, and getting yeah. all those pieces in place, getting the different vendors onboarded, you know, making sure they understand exactly, you know, getting the information that they need to be successful, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy lift. Yeah, it's not. I mean, yeah, I mean that's, you know, the, 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 you know, the, you know, the radical offering, what we built, uh, you know, our, our mission ultimately is to, you know, we want to bring nation state threat defense to our customers, you know, a, you know, a degree of, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, proactive attack service management, you know, and, and detection sophistication that we can actually keep a, you know, a nation state threat actor out for, you know, for as long as possible. And when, and if they do get in, we will see them and get them back out. Um, you know, that, that's our fundamental, you know, you know, mission, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we also help manage the compliance side and drive that. But part of what we do on the compliance side also, as you, as you alluded to, is that we take some of the hardest to do things off the table. Um, you know, CMMC requires you do log management, um, requires you to be able to detect threats, to investigate them, to respond to them, to manage vulnerabilities, to have security awareness training. Um, you know, the, you know, those are things that we're also just taking off the plate and saying covered, you know, it's done, um, which is, which, you know, is also why we can help to accelerate it. Um, and, you know, for us, it's really about doing those things really at a very high quality level. And then also helping to manage the other kind of blocking and tackling and seeing that get done well also, which is good for the customer. And then also good for us because it means there's likely to be less things to investigate and to have to, uh, you know, chase down. Yeah, and, and your, your last point aligns with something that we, we, we use the term trusted ecosystem, and I think you'd agree that what you say sort of aligns with that idea. Our trusted ecosystem is, you know, the right people and right products at the right time, right, to, to fulfill the yeah. mission. And you, you guys use the term the right tools and technology as well as those with the expertise to use them are the key to better yeah, security. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, this kind of, you know, comes back to I've had a long time, you know, a longstanding frustration, you know, with um, kind of the notion of cybersecurity, silver bullets, um, where there's always been this, I think, uh, hope that this magical technology would be invented and just make all this go away. We can just solve this with a product. And, you know, it's never, it, 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 it has never been true. Um, you know, maybe it'll be. Until radical, until, until radical, radical, it was never true. Yeah. But 
you have come up with the silver bullet for CMMC. That's what you're telling me today, yeah, right? I, I wish I could say that, but it's, yeah, they're, they're you know, <laughs> I mean, we, 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 yeah, we want to get to a more silver bullet. And we think, you know, we think AI is going to be a game changer there for us, you know, because, you know, part of what we're trying to do is, um, for us, fundamentally, we have to build a technology platform capability that can deliver a you know very sophisticated level of um, threat detection and response at speed that can be affordable for the segment and the ability to automate workflow to have you know AI take an increasingly large part of that is how we're going to get to something that is affordable at scale um, and also continues to improve from an efficacy perspective. Um, um, but there is still, and we, you know, we're a long way from taking you know, humans out of the equation and operations out of the equation. And security is a broad landscape. Um, and so for us, it's just for the domains we're going after, yes, we want to be as strong as silver bullet as possible. But there are no true silver bullets that are going to cover the whole spectrum, right? Uh, I wish I wish there yeah, were. Yeah, a lot of people do. It'd be nice. <laughs> although, although, although it'd be better if it comes out right after I retire, I, I still have a couple more good payments left to make. Right. So. <laughs> Silver bullet comes out, it might put me out of business, right? It put me out of work. So, um, right, I think we beat this up pretty good. Uh, anything we missed? Anything you wanted to add, Chris? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I, mean, I think uh, this has been great, and really appreciate the time. Yeah, same here. It, you know, it, it it sounds like you guys are. I can see the value prop. Like I'm kind of envisioning what you guys are doing, and it's it's. You know, it's almost the value prop of what you did with Logarithm, but a more purpose built to to address a, a particular market uh, and to address a particular set of requirements, which kind of even simplifies it a bit. Right. You know, because where Logarithm was a tool that could be used yeah. in you know hundreds of industries and, you know, from small to large company, you know, it, it's nice when you've got a more constrained um, solution uh, target. Uh, so so I, I got to imagine that you guys are going to uh, do some great things. We certainly intend to, yeah. We, um, yeah, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're off to, uh, off to a good start, and, um, and we intend to just, uh, you know, do better by our customers and just, you know, increase their security every single day. Uh, if somebody was interested in uh, your study, if somebody was interested in your services and product, how would they get in touch with you? I mean, you know, the, you know, the website is probably a great, uh, you know, a, a great place to start. Um, you know, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, and um, yeah, you know, email Chris at radical.com, you know, you know, shoot me an email directly as well. Happy to talk. Right. And just anyone listening, Radical is spelled oh. R-A-D-I-C-L. Yes, yeah, I, only, I only like companies that have hard to spell names, you know, logarithm. <laughs> that was a well, logarithm, I mean, both words were spelled properly. They were just were, glued together. Just, you know, you know, concatenate. Yeah, you know, radical, radical is, yeah. you know, it's ra the spelling is. I think radical is a little bit radical. easier. You just drop the A, R A D, you know, I C L. <laughs> a little bit easier than the spelling rhythm, but uh, we'll see. All right. <laughs> uh, well, well, listen, this has been great, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.